Hi everyone, I know it's been a while, so first of all, I want to apologize because it took way too long uh, before a new video was uploaded. Uh, first of all, let me explain you a few things. So the couple last months, I've been extremely busy with a lot of stuff. Um, as a lot of you probably already know, I lost a dear family member. So that was and still is extremely stressful. Of course, uh, I got a new dog, which is taking a lot of time, of course, as well. And uh, then I still have my other two dogs. And of course, I still have my snake my bird of prey, my other birds, my chickens and <laughs> all the other stuff. Uh, there's almost no time to make videos and of course the main problem is the virus. I cannot go to Germany, I cannot go to Belgium to metal detect or of course go back to the bunker where I found something very interesting uh, that I would like to show you guys but I cannot because I do not want people to recognize uh, that location. First I want to be sure that everything there is excavated completely uh, on my watch. I want to see it. I want to see what's happening there because I'm the person who found this and I do not want other people to screw this excavation up because this is something extremely personal. But uh, yeah, like I said, the virus is keeping me here. Um, I cannot go to Belgium. I cannot go to Germany for metal detecting and I cannot go back to the bunker because of this virus. So this virus is extremely irritating. But again, like I said before, we have to stay positive. And uh, another problem is that our family business now has no work because it's entertainment and um, we can we cannot do that right now because of the virus so that's also a very big problem um, I really hope we do not have to sell this house because if so my trench and bunker are gone I don't want to think about that so the only thing I can do now is do this make videos on YouTube enough talking right now you've been waiting long enough so let's get into the video yes as you can see German helmets we are going to talk about German helmets uh, well not obviously all German helmets because there are a lot of different models but we are going to uh, talk about one specific model which is the German beaded helmet. It's a very interesting topic because no one knows exactly 100% sure why it has that beat. Everyone has his own theory about that but we're going to talk about it and we are going to restore one of these helmets today. Okay, so the German beaded helmet. First, we're gonna talk about the main type of German helmets that we have. We have the M35, we have the M40, and we have the M42. We're not talking about the rare M45 model and uh, the earlier models and stuff like that, just the main models, the main three combat models. And also, of course, we still have the M16, the M18, M17 helmets from World War One that got reissued, blah, 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 but we're, again, we're not gonna talk about that because if I'm gonna talk about all helmets, uh, it will take weeks before I'm finished. So we're not gonna do that right now. Main helmets, M35, M40, M42, okay. So you can recognize the M35 helmet because the air vents are separate pieces. They are not stamped into the helmet and the edge is rolled. The M40 also has the edge rolled, but the air vents are actually stamped into the helmet. And then the latest model, M42. Again, the air vents are stamped into the helmet, so it's not a separate piece but the rolled edge is now just going outwards like that. It's not finished, it's not been nicely rolled, it's just like, it's, it's a very sharp edge. So that's a typical M42. So that's extremely typical about the M42, it has no edge, it's a very sharp rim. Now there are also a lot of Civic type lightweight German helmets, um, like the M34 square dip, and uh, of course the Gladiator model uh, that was mostly used by the Luftschutz. Like I said again, there are so many different models of, uh, of Civic type helmets. So the Civic model helmets were lightweight. Uh, they were not as durable as the normal combat type helmets like the M35, M40, M42. They looked a little bit different, but then you also had the combat type Civic beaded German helmet. A lot of times in the collector's world, this helmet is getting called uh, a Kratmelder. A helmet, which is a false name, it doesn't make any sense, it, just forget about that. So if you're calling a helmet like this a Kratmelder helmet, forget about that word because it doesn't make any sense. We also have this model, it's called the Gladiator model. You got them in different types and these helmets were available for normal citizens. They could buy them. Uh, a lot of times you can actually still see the price tag on the inside, how much it was. Uh, so that's really interesting. Normal civilians could buy these helmets. And these helmets were mostly used by the Luftschutz, air defense and stuff like that. And a lot of times you can see these helmets being used by the Hitler Youth, 
uh, by the flak crews and stuff like that. And these helmets were not really meant to be used in combat, but still they did use them in combat, especially in the end of the war uh, by the Volkssturm. There are even examples known with camouflage on them. Enough talking about the Gladiator model, we are talking about the beaded helmets. Okay, so this right here is a beaded helmet. So you can find these as the M35, the M40, and the M42, just like the other helmets, but then beaded. So why do these helmets have the bead around it? A lot of people are saying that these helmets got tested, failed the test, uh, got rejected, they had some kind of issue, maybe they were slightly bent or something like that. Uh, so they received a bead, got rejected, and were used for non-combat stuff like air defense and Polizei Feuerschutz stuff like that. That sounds like a pretty good explanation, but the only thing is a helmet cannot receive a beat when the steel is already hardened. Okay, let's go back to the factory. These helmets got stamped. They are going into an oven, they are extremely hot, then they were dropped into an oil bath uh, to harden the steel. Only then it would be possible to actually test them because the steel is hardened right now. You cannot test a helmet that's still soft. Um, but a helmet cannot receive a beat if the steel is already hardened. Because, as we know, the German helmet cracks. If it got hit by shrapnel or a bullet or whatever, if it got a very hard hit on the side or whatever, you can see a lot of times that these helmets actually got cracks because it's steel, it's Stahl. So if you think about that, it is actually not possible uh, that these helmets were ballistic rejects because if you want to add a beat in it like i said steel has to be soft because otherwise it would crack so it's not possible an interesting thing about these helmets also is that a lot of these do actually have production errors my good friend mark owns a few of these helmets he recently bought one that was actually welded in the factory and then painted so there is actually a crack in it it got welded and then it got painted so that's also a very interesting thing. So what I think is this. I think they were just stamping helmets all the time, of course, combat helmets, and they were like, okay, this one has a few problems, this one is not good, uh, that one is going to be beaded, and this one is, oh, this one is perfect, that one is going to be a normal combat helmet, because I don't see anything wrong with that. I think that is the only explanation. Of course, for the frontline troops, they want the strongest helmets, so they want them to be perfect. So they go to the left side, and, oh, this one has some kind of bend in it, but it's still a pretty good helmet, so we're just gonna throw that to the right side, that is going to be beaded. Also, some people think that the beat was added to make it more strong. I don't think that's true. Even though a beat like that would make it stronger, because, like, in barrels, you can see that they also have that uh, to make it stronger. But I think it's pure, so you can actually uh, recognize it as a... Um, civic type helmet and not as a normal combat helmet because if we go back to the gladiator model you can see that that one also has a beat but this one was purposely made like that so there's nothing wrong with this helmet but it still has a beat so i think it's pure like okay that is a civic type helmet and this is a normal combat helmet again no one knows 100 percent sure of course exactly how it went uh but this is the only thing I can think about. A lot of these helmets actually do not have any errors. They look perfectly fine, so I don't know. Most of these helmets were painted Luftschutzblau or Luftschutz Blue. You can find them without decals, you can find them with Luftschutz decals on the front, you can find them with Polizei or police decals on the sides. I've even seen them with a Luftschutz decal on the front and Polizei decals on the sides. And there is also a very interesting example of a helmet used by the Volkssturm, because even though these helmets were not meant to be used at the front lines, they still were used a lot of times at the front. This is a very nice example. This helmet was used by the Volkssturm. As you can see, someone placed decals on the sides and even on the front. This helmet is 100% authentic, so someone very late in the war uh, had some decals and just decided to place them on the sides and on the front because they are actually normal Wehrmacht decals. That's very interesting. They are regular army decals. So long story short, basically everything is possible with these helmets. Like I said, they were used for the police, they were used for the fire department, they were used for the Hitler Youth, uh, the flak crews and um, air defense and airfield protection and there are so many things that were used for. So yeah, again, it's a very interesting topic and compared to the normal standard combat helmets, they're not even that expensive. Even though it's a normal combat helmet, 
but used for something else. I once had a very nice M35 beaded helmet uh, and it was used by the Volkssturm because it had the same green and that's a typical green that was used by the Volkssturm. It had some very bad war damage on top of it and it was a, it was a very nice helmet. Too bad I sold it a while ago. A lot of times if you see these helmets painted green uh, they were used by the Volkssturm. Uh, but this video is actually about restoring one <laughs> so I'll just keep talking. Okay, alright so I saw a nice original beaded helmet shell for sale. Um, I noticed that it was the M42 model and the M42 model is the most rare as a beaded helmet because most of them are M40s or M35s. I saw an M42 and it was extremely uh, cheap so I decided to buy it. I was lucky. Once again I was lucky. When I received it I noticed that uh, there was once a Luftschutz decal on the front but it was removed um, it had some bad scratches all over the paint. It just wasn't worth it to to keep it like this. So I decided to restore this helmet. So what we are going to do is we are going to make a police helmet from this one. Uh, so I really hope you're going to enjoy this video. Let's get into the video right now. Alright, so here we have the M42 German helmet shell that we are going to restore. So I got this helmet for a very good price and I'm really happy with that because it's an M42. And the M42 is the most rare as a beaded helmet. It still has a lot of its original paint, but um, it's been damaged really bad. For instance, look at this. Here you can see the air vent, and someone has scratched it for some reason with, I think, steel wool. I don't know why you would do that, but it's completely ruining the look of this helmet, because you, you can see it's, it's light blue, so it looks pretty strange in person. It looks even worse. Um, also right there, it's been scratched. Um, on the front, we can see that there should be a Luftschutz decal. Uh, it's been removed. You can still see a little bit right there. It's almost nothing, but uh, there should be a decal right here. Uh, also something that's interesting is that this is gold. Normally when you remove the paint from a German helmet, it's always gonna be gray or silver colored. Uh, this is gold for some reason, so I'm thinking they've been using uh, different kinds of steel maybe. Looks almost like copper. Also something interesting is this right here. Can you see that? You can see these small lines. Uh, this is definitely evidence of a poor heating process. So that's also interesting. You see that a lot with M42 helmets. Um, on the back, again, it's been scratched, so it looks like uh, someone has been uh, scratching up the split pins. I don't know why. But also the air vents are scratched up, the decal has been removed. Uh, this has been scratched up. On top, we can see a lot more scratches. I really like it when a helmet has scratches, but these are not natural. Uh, scratches. This is not from where. This is definitely from someone doing this for some reason. Maybe a kid or something. I don't know. If we take a look on the inside, we can see a little bit of rust. It's interesting to see that the rust is there, there, and there, because normally there would be a liner in here, uh, but not a combat liner, but a liner uh, with cork between it. There would be cork right there, right there, and right there. And that is why there is rust in this whole area. So it looks like the liner was still in there not too long ago. Same for the decal, looks like it's been removed not too long ago. This helmet has a lot number, as it should have. The helmet is always marked there and there, or only in the back. It will be stamped with the lot number, um, the factory code and the size, and it normally would be right behind that hole for the split pin, but in this case it's over there. So, another interesting thing. More scratches on the inside. On camera you can't really see it, but in person it's just, yeah, you immediately see it, that it's just not natural wear. Alright, let's start restoring this helmet. The first thing I'm gonna do is remove that rust right there and right there. It's really light rust, so steel wool is enough. Alright, so you can still see the rust a little bit, but I cannot feel it anymore, so that's good enough. All right, also something interesting that I forgot to mention is this. Um, here you can see the bead, and the hole is like through it. And on this side, it's above it. See that? So that's really interesting. This split pin is going to be higher than this one. 
Uh, that's also evidence that this beat was done before the drilling of these holes because obviously you cannot roll a beat in it after the hole was already there. The steel would stretch and the hole would get bigger and oval. So this is a process that would be done after the beat. All right, so here I have the paint that I'm gonna use. It's Luftschutz Blau, uh, exact color from D-Day 1944. Um, I've never used this color before. I'm really curious what it's gonna look like, uh, but we're gonna test it, so. All right, I think we're ready. Uh, first, we're gonna do the inside of the helmet. Yeah, that's definitely blue. That is extremely blue. By the way, guys, there were a lot of different types of blue that they were using. Some of them are really blue. Some of them are dark blue. Some of them are light blue. A lot of varieties. This is definitely Luxus Blau. I see another corner that I still have to spray. So now we're gonna let this dry. Gonna spray the split pins. All right, so here we have three new split pins, and I'm gonna use a piece of cardboard. It's also funny because if you see original German tunic buttons, you can also see that they were sprayed like this. The split pins were not sprayed at the same time as the helmet was sprayed, so that's also correct what we're doing right now. A lot of times the color is also different with the helmet. You definitely want all sides, oops, covered, including my hand. My hand is now Luftschutzblau. There we go, three split pins. Oh yeah, I'm really happy with the color. It looks really good, and like I said before, there were a lot of different types of blue that they used for Luftschutz helmets. Dark blue, light blue, but this is definitely a color that I've seen before many times. So, that is really nice. Uh, obviously, it's still not dry, but I think we can still just already do the outside of the helmet because I cannot wait. Now we're gonna let it dry and spray it one more time. But so far this is looking really good. I'm gonna eat something right now, but I'm definitely gonna put this table with this helmet on it somewhere else because there are a lot of birds flying around and I do not want bird poop inside of my paint. All right, it's time for the second layer. The sun is shining, perfect day for a helmet restoration. Yep. Okay, there's a dog hair in the paint right now. It's like right on top. But I'm not gonna mess with it. I'm not gonna grab it now. When it's dry, I'm gonna just take it out. All right, so here we are. Uh, the helmet is still not completely dry, but it's sort of dry, uh, so we can install the liner. This is the liner that we're gonna use. It's a Civic type liner. It's a typical liner that they use for Luftschutz helmets. As you can see, it's not as the combat liners. Uh, this one is made from paper, actually, pressed paper. And yeah, this is just leather, leather chin strap attached to the paper. So it's not a loose uh, liner band from aluminum or uh, zinc or iron. It's just really simple and cheap paper. And here we got the cork, what I was talking about earlier. Most of the times the M42 helmet actually had uh, the liner made from cloth. So it's just cloth and a chin strap made from, believe it or not, plastic. I got one of those helmets upstairs but uh, basically they used everything for these helmets. So there are so many different types of Civic liners. Some were made by private companies. Uh, this is an official one. Uh, these were mostly used in the earlier models, but of course, if they still had a bunch of them left, they would use them as well for the late war models. So completely correct. Now it's time to install it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this because like I said, the paint is not completely dry still and I don't wanna damage it. So here we go. Here we got the split pins. They look really nice. These liners are a lot more easier to install than uh, the combat liners because those have the iron liner band 
uh, and it's yeah pretty hard to get your fingers between that stuff. So let me get this rope off. I don't really like the quality of this rope. It's a little bit flat. It's not really looking like the right type. So I'm gonna use another one for that. Okay, it's a little bit broken right there. Happened during shipping. I also still had some washers from another helmet. So I'm gonna use those to make it a little bit more stronger. There we got that hole. You want that hole to be right there. And here goes the split pin. Really nice matching colors. So now on the inside, we can take a look. Now I'm gonna use the washer to make it more strong. There we go. Push it against the side and make it nice and tight. There we go. There we go. Our liner is installed. You can still feel that the paint is not completely dry. I'm gonna let it dry for at least 48 hours before I'm gonna apply the decals. All right, so here we have the helmet. And as you can see, the paint is now nice and dry. So it's time for us to apply the decals. Um, so what do we need for applying the decals? Well, we need two brushes, some water, pure turpentine, a piece of cloth, the glue for the decals, and of course, the decals. All right, so these are not the standard decals that you can buy everywhere. These are really high quality decals. Um, they're just like the original ones. Here we go. Oh yeah, that looks really, really good. That's really high quality. Uh, so again, these come from D-Day 1944. Let me give you a good close up of that. That's some really, really high quality. Yep, they look really good. Um, applying these decals is always really scary because if it goes wrong, uh, well, you cannot just do it again. And uh, even if it goes wrong, it's still correct because you see a lot of original helmets where the decal has been placed very poorly or even on the vent hole and stuff like that. So, But of course, we want it to be nice. So we're gonna do our best, but with this rim, I've never done that before. A lot of times with these beaded helmets, you can see uh, the decals being placed right there. So above this rim or right here. But most of the times they are just placed over this rim. So that's what we're gonna do right now. Okay, so we're gonna start with this decal. We're gonna place it in the water for 30 seconds minimum. Okay, so it's been 30 seconds. Now we're gonna take it out and we're gonna place it on this cloth right there. Okay, what we're gonna do right now is apply this glue. So I need my brush for that. I'm just gonna do this and then just spread it out like that. You want more glue than the actual decal. And something that I forgot to mention, you need this because this will indicate when the glue will be ready. When this gets sticky, the glue will be ready and we can apply the decal. As you can see now, it's getting sticky. Let's wait a little longer. Yep, that's good. Now we're gonna check if our decal is ready. And as you can see, we can move it around so it's ready. We're gonna get some water and make this completely wet. And don't be afraid to put a lot of water on there because if it goes wrong, you can still adjust it a little bit. You don't want it to be too sticky because otherwise you will have a problem. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna apply the decal. This is always the scary part, but right, here we go. Hold it like this. I always get shaky when I'm doing this. Sorry if the view is not too good, but I don't want to screw this up. So I'm just gonna do it like that. My finger is a little bit sticky, but here we go. Now, you use the soft part of this paper to get rid of the air bubbles. It's looking pretty good. Be really, really gentle. It's not completely straight, but I don't worry about that because most of the original helmets actually have that. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use pure turpentine to get rid of the axis glue that's right here. That's really important to do that. Be careful, but you wanna get rid of all this glue. Then use a piece of cloth to clean the helmet completely. And again, be very careful with the decal. Now it's time to do the other one. Here we go. Now you can see a little bubble 
but that's no problem. We can just push the air bubble out. Be sure to be really, really careful. We want to be extremely careful. You do not want to screw this up. And it's also really important to use the smooth side of this paper. Do not push on the decal. It will ruin your day. All right, that looks really, really good. Uh, now we want to leave these decals alone. They have been successfully applied you see these wrinkles? Those will disappear after a while. It's actually gonna be a couple weeks before these decals are completely hardened out. All right, so here we have the helmet. I'm really happy with the paint. I'm really happy with the decals, but there is one thing, or actually two things, that I'm not really happy about, and that's going to be the liner and the split pins. The split pins move a little bit around. And I don't like that, and I'm gonna explain you why that's happening. And the liner is a little bit too small. I mean, it works, but first I thought this was a 64 shell, but it looks like it's gonna be a 66. But I've seen it before. I've seen bigger helmets with smaller liners. Um, sometimes you can see some more cork between there. It fits me perfectly fine, but you know what? We're just gonna install another liner. Here we have a new liner and new split pins. Um, so yeah, I ordered new split pins, I painted them again, I'm gonna show you the difference in a moment, but first we are going to remove this liner. I can always use these split pins and liner for another helmet, and the liner is gone. Alright, so I bought this liner, and they come with these split pins, but this is way smaller than the actual hole, so it moves around, as you can see. So if it goes like that, it will keep moving around. And I don't like that, so I just bought the standard normal split pins um, and I pinned them again right here. These are the normal standard split pins that they would use for these helmets because this is a normal German Stahlhelm. The only difference is the beat. This one is shorter, this one is a little bit longer but way thinner. So this one would fit a lot better. So that's what we're gonna do. And first of all, let's see if this 66 liner is actually going to fit. Yep. Yeah. Fits perfectly fine. Okay, so that makes sense. It was really hard to read the stamp. I can read EF, and I thought it was 64, but it's actually 66. We're gonna do the exact same thing again. And this goes over that, just like so. Now you push, you want it to be really tight. Sorry for the angle, it's really hard to film this. But you push, and then just fold it like that and push on the outside at the same time. And it's gonna look like that. You want it to be really tight. Nice and tight, yeah, this is a lot better. And I know there's just randomly a cannonball ugh, laying right here. Uh, we were cleaning up the basement and I found this cannonball again. I found it a while ago. And I didn't know where it was, but we found it again. It was in the basement between 10 and 11 kilos. It's extremely heavy and extremely old. Awesome piece of history. So they are saying exact replica rope, but that's definitely not the case. So we're gonna get rid of that. The liner itself though is really, really nicely made. This is a lot better. This is perfect for a late war um, Battle of Berlin display or reenactment. That's a brand new, original, restored, beaded German M42 helmet. I'm really happy with the result.